Hello everyone, I'm Governor Mara Dixon and I'm the Managing Director for our Government Solutions. Our Government Solutions, as you would have known, is a consulting firm that assists health professionals such as doctors with product sourcing strategies as well as the starting and managing of medical laboratories. Now, today I'd just like to talk to you about the book Clinical Laboratory Science. That's a book by Mary Louise Sturgeon. It's a book about all the disciplines of the medical lab and how they all work together in order to create a successful organization in the form of a medical laboratory. Now, it shows you the basic routine techniques. This is the front page for the book, by the way. Quite an attractive front page. Alright, so I'm just going to go to the table of contents. Oh, this is the sixth edition, by the way. That's edition number six. So this is the table of contents for clinical laboratory science. So it talks about basic laboratory techniques. Chapter 1 is about the fundamentals of the clinical laboratory. Chapter 2 is about safety in the clinical lab. 3 is about phlebotomy, collection and processing blood. You know, systems of measuring um, laboratory equipment and reagents, microscope, basic and new techniques in the clinical lab, laboratory mathematics and solution preparation quality assessment and quality control in the clinical lab, point of care testing, laboratory information systems and automation. And now part two, that was part one, which is the basic laboratory techniques. Part two is about the clinical laboratory specializations. So these are the specializations. So you have introduction to clinical chemistry, Principles and Practice of Clinical Hematology, Introduction to Hemostasis, Renal Physiology and Urinalysis, Examination of Body Fluids and Miscellaneous Specimens, Introduction to Microbiology, Immunology and Serology, Immunohematology and Transfusion Medicine. Okay, so I'm going to go to the fundamentals of clinical laboratory see exactly what, what are the fundamentals. Okay. So it talks about the history of clinical laboratory science, the profession, medical ethics, healthcare organization, laboratory medicine, clinical pathology, and the departments or divisions, all of that information is there. Right, and there is a microscope at the top here. The microscope is pretty much the most important instrument used, or the most commonly used instrument for a medical laboratory scientist. Okay, so clinical laboratory testing plays a crucial role in the detection, diagnosis, and treatment of disease. Medical laboratory scientists and medical laboratory technicians collect and process specimens and perform chemical, biological, hematologic, immunologic, microscopic and molecular diagnostic and microbial testing. They may also collect and prepare blood for transfusion. Laboratory aides may also be members of the laboratory team. After collecting and examining a specimen, laboratory professionals analyze results and relay them to physicians or other healthcare providers. In addition to routine testing, duty, duties in a clinical laboratory including developing and modifying procedures and monitoring programs to ensure the accuracy of test results. Alright, so the history of this profession as a clinical laboratory science profession. So rudimentary examinations of human body fluids date back to the time of the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates around 300 BC. But it was not until 1896 that the first clinical laboratory was opened in a small room equipped at a cost of $50 at Johns Hopkins Hospital. 
Baltimore, Maryland. The diagnostic and therapeutic value of the laboratory testing was not yet understood. Many physicians viewed clinical laboratories simply as an expensive luxury that consumed both valuable space and time. Discovery of the causative agents of devastating epidemics such as tuberculosis, diphtheria, and cholera in the 1980s and the subsequent development of tests for their detection in the late 1890s. So the detection in the 1880s and in 1890s highlighted the importance of laboratory tests. So basically, you know, microbiology aspect of it was what highlighted the importance of the medical lab because most of them were not really seeing the value of it to diagnosis and therapeutics because it wasn't fully understood and they saw it as being expensive and costing valuable space and time so that's the history of it Talking about medical ethics. Right, code of ethics, duty to the patient, duty to society, duty to colleagues and the profession. So this is a pledge to the profession as a clinical laboratory professional. I strive to maintain and uh, Promote standards of excellence in performing and advancing the art and science of my profession. Preserve the dignity and privacy of others. Uphold and maintain the dignity and respect of our profession. Seek to establish cooperative and respectful working relationships with our health professionals. Contribute to the general well-being of the community. I will actively demonstrate my commitment to these responsibilities throughout my professional life. And this is the organizational chart. So we have the president CEO for the hospital. For the hospital, that's the organizational chart. So laboratory medicine or clinical pathology is the medical discipline in which clinical laboratory science and technology are applied to the care of patients. Laboratory medicine comprises several major scientific disciplines, clinical chemistry and urinalysis, hematology including flow cytometry, clinical microbiology, immunology, molecular diagnostics and blood banking. Each discipline of laboratory medicine is described in more detail in later chapters of the book. Many changes are taking place in the clinical laboratory and are already affecting the types of tests being offered. Anatomic pathology, cytology and histology are part of the overall clinical laboratory but usually function separately. Figure 1.2 shows a possible system for the organization of the clinical laboratory. In addition to the traditional areas I already mentioned, the disciplines of cytogenetics, toxicology, flow cytometry, and other specialized divisions are present in larger laboratories. Molecular diagnostics is done in many laboratories. Another change has been the move from tests being done in the centralized laboratory setting to the point of care testing. Alternative testing sites, the patient's best bedside in 
operating rooms or recovery areas or even home testing or extensions of the traditional clinical life. So the point of care testing, the alternative testing sites are like the patient bedside in the operating room or home testing. The leaders and managers of a clinical laboratory must be certain must be certain are legal operating regulations. Having met. all persons working in lab settings are fully aware of the importance of compliance with these regulations. Alright. So this is the organization of the clinical lab. So here you have anatomical pathology, histology or the supervisor autopsy service. You have laboratory medicine where you have molecular diagnostics. You have chemistry, coagulation, hematology, immunology, microbiology, and toxicology, point of care testing, Support services, central processing, phlebotomy, clerical services, laboratory. So this is the overall organization of the lab. Anatomical pathology will have to do with histology and cytology. And laboratory medicine, where you have the chemistry, the hematology, the microbiology, the immunology, the serology, and the toxicology, and molecular biology. Diagnostics. Okay, so let me move down. So the laboratory departments are divisions. The organization of a particular clinical lab depends on its size, the number of tests done, and the facilities available. Larger laboratories tend to be departmentalized. There is a separate area designated for each of the various divisions. The current trend is to have a more open design or a core lab where personnel can work in any of several areas. Cross training is important in a core lab model. So here you have hematology which is a study of blood. The form elements of the blood or blood cells include erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, leukocytes, white blood cells, and thrombocytes, which are platelets. The routine hematology. Go back up. Routine hematology. Screening test for abnormalities in the blood is a complete blood count. So that is routine screening tests. It is a CBC. Most CBCs include red blood cell count, white blood cell count, platelet count, hemoglobin concentration, hematocrit, and a percentage differential of white blood cells present. The results of the CBC are useful in diagnosis, diagnosing anemia, in which there are too few RBCs or too little hemoglobin in leukemia in which there are too many white blood cells or abnormal white blood cells and infectious processes of several etiologies in which changes in white blood cells are noted. These tests are done in most hematology laboratories by use of an automated instrument. Many of these automated cell counters also provide automated white blood cell differential separating the types of white blood cells present by size maturity and nuclear and cytoplasmic characteristics. Cell cones for other body fluids such as cerebrospinal fluid or synovial fluid are also performed in some hematology laboratories. The work done in the hematology lab also has a microscope component where you have microscopic assessment of a stained blood film, film rather, is done as part of some CBCs. 
especially when automated instrumentation is not readily available or when a more complete morphologic examination is necessary. Other tests done in hematology labs are reticular side count, you have an urethra side sedimentation rate, ESR measurements. Examination of bone marrow is done in special hematology divisions where trained hematopathologists and technologists are present to examine the slides. Another department you have is the hemostasis and coagulation. Work done in hemostasis and coagulation assess bleeding and clotting problems. In some, in some laboratories, hematology and coagulation tests are part of the same laboratory department. The two tests most often performed in the coagulation laboratory are pro-thrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time. These tests can be used to identify potential bleeding disorders and to monitor anticoagulant therapy. Patients who have had a heart attack or stroke, both caused by formation of blood clots, are given medications that anticoagulate these blood to slow the clotting process. So the two tests most often performed in coagulation laboratory are the prothrombin time, as mentioned as PT and activated partial thromboplastin time. Yeah. Now we have urinalysis. The urinalysis lab is where you have routine urine screening tests. Historically, the routine urine was one of the earliest laboratory tests performed. So the urine test was one of the first laboratory tests that was done in history. And it, is, it still provides valuable information for the detection of disease related to the kidney and urinary tract. By evaluating the results of the three common parts of urinalysis, observation of the physical characteristics of the urine specimen itself, that is color, clarity, specific gravity, screening for chemical Components, for example, pH, that's potential hydrogen, glucose, ketone bodies, protein, blood, bilirubin, urobilinogen, nitrates, leukocyte esterase, and microscopic examination of the urinary sediment. Metabolic diseases such as diabetes mellitus, kidney disease, and infectious diseases of the urinary bladder our kidney can be diagnosed and monitored. Now, clinical chemistry. Clinical chemistry lab performs quantitative analytical procedures on a variety of body fluids, but primarily on serum or plasma that has been processed from whole blood collected from the patient. Tests are also done and the urine are less frequently on body fluids such as CSF, that's cerebrospinal fluid. Several hundred analytes can be tested in the chemistry lab, but a few tests are used much more often to assist in diagnosis of disease. One of the most common performed chemistry tests is blood glucose, which overall um, correlates with diabetes. Other frequently performed assays include cholesterol, electrolytes, and serum protein. Blood glucose tests are used to diagnose and monitor diabetes mellitus. Cholesterol is a test that is part of the batch of tests to monitor the patient's lipid status. Electrolytes affect many of the metabolic processes of the body including maintenance of osmotic pressure and water distribution in various body compartments, maintenance of pH regulation of the functioning of the heart and other muscles, and oxidation reduction processes. So that's what the chemistry section is about. And let's move down to blood banking or immunohematology. 
When blood is donated for transfusion processes, it must undergo a rigorous protocol of testing to make certain it is safe for transfusion. Okay, proper sample identification is particularly crucial in blood banking procedures because a mislabeled specimen could result in severe transfusion reaction or even death of the recipient. Most of the testing done in blood bank is based on antigen antibody reactions. In the specialized tests performed in the blood bank laboratory, antigens are specific proteins attached to the red or white blood cell. The nature of specific antigens determines the blood group assigned ABO or AB. RH typing is also done with blood being classified as RH positive or RH negative. Donated blood is also screened for any unusual antibodies present for the presence of antibodies associated with bloodborne diseases such as hepatitis virus or HIV. The donor blood must be matched to the prospective recipients to ensure that they are compatible. When a blood transfusion is ordered, it is extremely important that only properly matched blood is transfused. So that's the blood banking in general. Then you have immunology and serology. The normal immune system functions to protect the body from foreign microorganisms that may invade it. So that's a function of a normal immune system to protect the body from foreign microorganisms. When foreign material that is something that the body does not already have as part of itself enters the body, the immune system works to eliminate the foreign material, which can be bacteria, virus, fungi, or parasites. The body's defensive action is carried out by its white blood cells. Those are the lymphocytes, monocytes, and other cells. Through which the invading microorganism is eliminated or controlled. As in the blood bank lab, many of the immunology or serology laboratory procedures are based on antigen antibody reactions. When foreign material is introduced into the lab, into the body, the body reacts by means of its immune system to make antibodies to the foreign antigen. The antibodies formed by can be measured in the laboratory. In the evaluation of each of certain infectious disease, detection of antibodies in the serum of the patient is as an important step in making and confirming a diagnosis and managing the illness. Okay, let's move on to this paragraph. In addition to his value in the diagnosis of infectious disease, immunologic testing performed in a dedicated immunology lab or immunoassay performed in clinical chemistry department can identify normal or abnormal levels of immune cells and serum components. So that's basically immunology and serology. Now you have molecular diagnostics. Biotechnology is the fastest growing discipline of the diagnostic lab. Molecular biology or the discipline of molecular diagnostics uses these technology. Molecular pathology applies the principles of basic molecular biology to the study of human diseases. New approaches to human disease assessment are being developed by clinical laboratories because of the new information about the molecular basis of disease processes in general. Traditional laboratory analyses give results based on the description of events currently occurring in the patient. For example, blood cell counts, infectious processes, blood glucose concentration. You know, but molecular biology introduces a predictive component And findings from these tests can be used to anticipate events that may occur in the future when patients may be at risk of particular disease or condition. So 
it has a predictive component, the molecular diagnostic um, department, which helps in you determine if the patient is probably predisposed to a particular condition. Maybe it's a heart disease or any other genetic component. In microbiology lab now, the microorganisms that cause disease are identified, these are known as pathogens. So these are the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi and parasites are identified in typical clinical lab. Specimen sent to the clinical mo molecular, rather the microbiology lab for culture include swabs from the throat or wounds, sputum, vaginal excretions, urine and blood. It is important for the microbiology staff to be able to differentiate normal biota or normal flora. Those are organisms that are usually present at specific sites in the body from pathogenic flora. So you have normal flora and pathogenic. Normal flora is not um, infectious. It's just organisms that are usually present at specific areas in the body from the pathogenic which are disease causing organisms. So you have various differential testing which is done for inoculation and incubation of the specific culture, classic culture of the plate. For the observation of an organism's growth characteristics, the use of gram staining techniques to separate gram positive from gram negative organisms. Once a pathogen is suspected, more testing is done to confirm its identity. Rapid testing methods have been developed to identify routine pathogens. And you have immunologic tests that have been devised using monocular, rather monoclonal antibodies to identify the streptococcal organism causing pharyngitis or strep throat. Yes, a strep throat is a common infectious disease you'll see in the medical lab. You'll get a, a throat swab for such a patient. So you're talking about the clinical laboratory staffing you now and the functions of the pathologist. Most clinical laboratories are operated under the direction of pathologists. So the clinical laboratory can be divided into two main sections. You have anatomic pathology and clinical pathology. Most pathologists have training in both anatomic and clinical pathology. Although research can be substituted for the clinical pathology portion of So most pathologists have training in both anatomic and clinical pathology, although research can be substituted for clinical pathology portion of the pathology residence program. So the anatomic pathologist is a licensed physician usually trained for four to five years after graduation from medical school to examine all surgically removed specimens from the patient, which include frozen sections, tissue samples, and autopsy specimens. Examination of pop smears and other cytologic and histologic examinations are also generally done by an anatomic pathologist. You have a clinical pathologist too, which is a licensed physician with additional training in clinical pathology and laboratory medicine. Under the direction of a clinical pathologist, many specimen common laboratory tests such as blood and urine tests are performed. Consultation with physician is also important. Any information gained concerning the patient's case is actually the result of a collaborative activity between the laboratory and the attending physician. Pathologists will perform only certain services such as examination of surgical specimens 
which is done primarily by the anatomic pathologist. Okay. Then you have the laboratory supervisor or manager. The next person in line. And you have a technologist, the technicians, and specialists. So the primary accrediting organizations for clinical laboratories. In current laboratory settings, many government regulations, along with regulations and recommendations from professional state and federal accreditation agencies and commissions of various types govern the activities of the laboratory. In the United States, there are approximately 15,206 accredited laboratories. 97% of which are inspected by three primary accreditation organizations. You have the COLA, the CAP, and the TJC. In Jamaica, you have JANAC. Yeah. JANAC is the accreditation agency for medical laboratories in Jamaica. So the Commission of Officer Laboratory, Office Laboratory, you have accreditation, COLA accredits 6,179 facilities, or 70% of laboratory. It was founded in 1988 as a private alternative to help laboratories stay in compliance with the new CLIA regulations. In 1993, the Healthcare Finance Administration granted COLA, COLA, deeming authority under CLIA, and in 19 97, the Joint Commission of Accreditation of Healthcare Organization, that's JCAHO, now known as the Joint Commission, TJC, also recognized COLA's laboratory accreditation program. So COLA is basically one of the accreditation bodies they use in the United States. It is the first organization to, the, to be renewed since increased government scrutiny of survey organizations and will be given permission to accredit laboratories for the next six years to help labs meet the CLIA requirements. And you have the College of American Pathologists, which accredits 5,179 or 34% of laboratories. And you have the Joint Commission, as mentioned, which accredits 3,467, 23% of it. So these are the three main bodies, the Joint Commission, the College of American Pathologists, and the COLA, that's the Commission of Office Laboratories. So the external government laboratory accreditation and regulation. Let's take a look at the COLA again. So they are the Commission of Office Laboratory Accreditation. So you have other agencies such as the Association of Blood Banks, American Association of Blood Banks, American Society of Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics, and the American Osteopathic Association, which accredits 381 facilities or 3% of laboratories. To so have external government laboratory accreditation or regulation. So the clinical laboratory Improvement Amendment of 1988 is what they use for the accreditation process, CLIA 88. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump back to the table of contents here. And so 
jump into one of these um, specializations introduction to clinical chemistry clinical hematology let's go to renal physiology and urinalysis so that's 358 and then I'm going to look at immunology and serology so first I look at uh, 358 and I go to 520 Seems as if it's not functioning as it usually functions. Okay, thank you so much for your time. If you need more information, you can Google GovMed Solutions or Governor Maradixo, or you can visit our website. And you can also visit Amazon.com where we have books available. Uh, Personalize Your Medical Laboratory is one book at Amazon.com. And uh, Seals in Laboratory Medicine. We also have a book called Selling Governor Maradixo, that's a book on digital marketing that can apply to online businesses such as medical laboratories. Thank you.